Hey, it's me. Welcome to another episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. Here we are, speaking with Susan Birkenhead. She's one of the most in-demand lyricists. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. I think most stories start best from the beginning. Where are you from? Born and bred in New York. Born and bred in New York. Yes. Yes, one of those, a rarity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in my profession, apparently. But yes, I'm a New Yorker. And your parents, where are they from? Um, they were both born in New York as well. Okay. Yes. And if you could describe a typical day around the household when you were growing up, what would you say it was like? Oh, my goodness. Well... We lived with my grandparents, all of us in a big house. And what was it like? My brother is a lot younger than I am, so he was a baby. I would come home from school and I would have to practice piano for an hour at least. And once or twice a week I had ballet lessons. And I was one of those over-programmed children and I had swimming lessons on other days, and um, and I had to go to Hebrew school. It was just, I really had very little time to myself during the week. But on the weekends, I was able to go out and play. And I mean, other than that, I, I really wasn't home all that much because I was always either at school or at these lessons. So the piano lessons, your parents encouraged you in terms of they were interested in music. Very. Um, apparently, according to my mother, I started picking out tunes when I was three. This is what she says. I'm, it's probably apocryphal, but I did begin lessons at four, which is way too early, and studied piano and then went to the High School of Music and Art and studied flute as well. When all the time, all I really wanted to do was be an actress and a singer. Ah, so originally you wanted to be on the performing end. Yes, exactly. I wanted to go to performing arts. They wanted me to go to music and art. They wanted me to be Mozart, and I wanted to be on the stage. Well, what got you over to the writing side of things? What was it that sparked that interest of yours? I was always apparently doodling around with, with writing. My mother read read to me constantly. My mother and father loved Gilbert and Sullivan. They loved English movies. They they loved reading. So I was always interested in words. When I graduated from college, I immediately went out and started to audition because all I did in college really was act I was always rehearsing and performing. And the audition process I found really daunting, really daunting. I, Even though I began to have success with it, I knew that the audition process was going to kill me. So I had gotten married while I was in college. Much to my parents' chagrin, I got married at 19 the first time. And what I did was run away from the acting and start having babies and I had four children and used a lot of music with my kids and and I was doing a little bit of acting and singing on the side and I began writing children's things and to make a somewhat long story very short the woman who had written the libretto to one of these children's things that I did. These children's things were done locally and in a couple of professional theaters locally. And this woman's husband was on a plane going to Europe and was sitting next to a television producer. And he started talking about his wife's version of Rumpelstiltskin. And the man said, well, I don't have time to read anything. Send me a tape. And I got a letter <laughs> out of the blue from this man who said, I heard your 
you know, your score for Rumpelstiltskin. And I, he introduced himself and said he had produced lots of stuff for NBC and, and other television stations. And he would like to option the, the music and the uh, libretto. And I asked my then husband, what does that mean? He said, it means you need an, an agent. So he took me to an agency that he knew. He was a, a college professor, but he managed a summer theater, and he did a lot of booking, and so he knew several agents. And the agent was Shirley Bernstein, who was Leonard Bernstein's sister. And she said, well, what would you really like to do? And I said, I, re- I would really like to write for the theater. And she said, well, you need to audition for Lehman Engel's Musical Theater Workshop, which is run by BMI, which is a music licensing organization. And I found out the requirements, and I wrote two songs and went and auditioned for Lehman, and I was accepted. And then everything just happened by accident. This is a really strange story because um, all of a sudden I got a phone call. I was home feeding the baby, one of the babies, and feeding the other children, and I got a phone call, and this woman's voice said, Hi, this is Mary Rogers. And I said, Who? And she said, Mary Rogers, I'm a composer. And I said, Wait a minute, you mean once once on a mattress, Mary Rogers? And she said, Yes. (laughs) And she said, We have the same agent, and she just gave me some of your lyric to read. At that time, I was doing my own music as well. She said, but I read some of your lyrics, and I've just been asked to be one of the writers in a new Broadway musical, and I was wondering, and I said, yes. (laughs) She said, don't you want to know what it is? I said, no, no, it's okay. And that was a musical called Working, which was based on a book by Studs Terkel. There were, it was optioned by Stephen Schwartz, and there were five writers involved, and I became one of those writers with Mary. And so that was, you know, I sort of fell into it with a big bang. Mm. Wow. And then we were working on it just for a few months, and she called me one day and she said, I'm getting off the phone really fast because Julie Stein is going to call you. And I choked. <laughs> and she, I said, what, what, why? She said, well, he, he called Steve and Steve is busy. And, and Steve said to him, you should call, Mary has this new lyricist and um, you should really call her. And so she hung up the phone and he called <laughs> and I went in to see him and he became really my mentor my teacher, my surrogate father, and as I like to say, my PhD. And that began everything. If you had to describe Julie Stein. Oh, yes. (laughs) What was the man like? (sighs) What was the man like? He was very short. He was a gambler. I mean, this is well known. He went to OTB every single day and he took me to the track with him once a week. He was like a Damon Runyon character, but he was a genius and he had an unending well of music inside of him. He would, you know, as I was walking out the door every day, he would say, a little exit music and he would improvise something on the piano and I would say, oh my God, tape that. And he would say, nah, nah, there's plenty where that came from. (laughs) He was extraordinary. He knew everybody because he had been in Hollywood for most of his life as a vocal coach and a very famous pop songwriter. And when he began to write for the theater, I think the first thing he wrote was, was his high button shoes or something like that. No, was I can't even remember. But he fell in love with the theater, madly in love with the theater. And that's all he wanted to do from that point on. What else can I say about him? <laughs> I loved him, loved him. What would you say he taught you? 
Oh, my God. He taught me everything a songwriter really has to know. I mean, Lehman taught me the basics of writing for the musical theater. Julie taught me things like words you can sink your teeth into or which consonants and which vowels ride a note, you know, a particular note in the best of all possible ways. The most important thing he taught me was simplicity because like all budding songwriters, I had this incredible urge to show show off the fact that he used to say, we all, you know, he spoke like, like a Damon Runyon character. He would say, yeah, yeah, we all know you went to college. I mean, so you can write these 57 syllable words, he said, but let me, let me teach you something about simplicity. And he gave me a stack of Irving Berlin records. And he said, you go home this weekend and you listen to every single thing that Irving wrote and then come back. And he said, his genius was being able to be incredibly articulate and profound in the simplest of ways. And he was right. I mean, a song like, what'll I do? <laughs> you know, so simple and so incredibly moving and wonderful and beautiful. What else? He taught me more about collaboration. He taught me to write for a star even when you don't have a star. He said when you're writing for a character, have a particular actor in mind when you write for that character, which will make it even more specific. Even though you never, you know, that actor never agrees to do your particular show, you'll have a real flesh and blood person and voice in mind. And he was right. He also said the most valuable thing he said was, it only comes at them once, so you damn well better make them understand it, which which was really a great thing to say because in the theater you don't have, you know, many takes and you don't have a second chance and you can't go to, back to the beginning of the record and listen again. It really has to reach them. So... I mean, it was an unending education with Julie. I want to talk a little bit about working. A lot of the listeners okay. are probably familiar with the book, but yes, the book by Stud Sturgle. But tell us about this production. Well, you know, it was a big flop. <laughs> what happened was that Stephen Schwartz optioned the property from Studs, and decided that he was going to direct it. And Stephen had never directed before. And he also had this idea that he would get lots of different songwriters and 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 have a sort of eclectic score. I'm not telling tales out of school because Stephen and I are good friends now. But this was a wobbly time. It was he was feeling his way. I was brand new. He kept the writers I don't think he did this purposely, but he sort of kept the writers in separate corners so that it wasn't uh, – when you write a musical, it's really most important that everybody be in the same room on the same page writing towards the same end. Otherwise, it never works. And we were assigned – initially, there was going to be a a storyline about a family that – packed up and left home and traveled to another city where the father had a new job. And we would follow this family and they would meet. I don't know if your listeners, well, I guess if they're familiar with the book, they know it's a series of, of interviews with people in the workforce, everything from executives to a cleaning woman, to a school teacher, to to a prostitute, to a truck driver, to people, how people feel about their work, whether it's satisfying or frustrating or whatever. And so Mary and I were to write the songs for this family, and the family would be used as a sort of frame for the whole story. 
and along the way they would meet other people. There was a workshop first in New York, and people, I, I think the other writers either chose their interviews from the book or were assigned them. We were assigned the family, and we were assigned the school teacher and an airline stewardess. I, I think that's, I think those were the only ones we were assigned. And so we began to write songs. And somewhere along the way, I think Steve was writing the book with a woman named Nina Fazzo, who was a writer, but I don't think had ever written a book for a musical either. And we all started bringing in songs. And I think it was when we we got to Chicago. We were trying out in Chicago. And it was suddenly decided that we would not use this framework. Or maybe it was still back in New York during the workshop. And that there would just be individual characters. And somehow or other, they would find a way to tie the characters together without having a framework. So the family songs went out the window. And we were left with a housewife song, which we had already written, and the stewardess and the school teacher. So I wrote the school teacher song and brought it in. And oh my God, he was thrilled, 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 thrilled. And we brought in the, the housewife song and he was thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. And then I said to Mary, I don't know what to do with this stewardess thing. I just, it just didn't seem to have any dramatic thrust to it. We didn't quite know what to do. And she said, I have an idea. And Mary had grown up with and was very, very close to Steve Sondheim. And she said, he's really great when you're stuck on something and when you can't figure something out. So she called up and I went over and spent time with him, which was another amazing experience. And he told me, he taught me something that I have never forgotten, which is probably the single most important thing for any songwriter to know in the theater. Hmm. And that is that when the parameters seem impossible, you're forced to do your most creative work you're really forced to find a creative solution. And it's it's frustrating and it's torture, but it usually results in a much better solution. So we came back in, I think we started to write this song, and for some reason, they had decided, even after we brought the song in, that they weren't going to use the stewardess because they had to have a certain number of of uh, monologues and a certain number of songs and they wanted to be able to tie the characters together or whatever. A lot of my memories of working are a little bit vague because I was so blown away by the fact that I was in a room with these people when six months before that I had been this, you know, housewife and mother in Glen Cove, New York, that I was just dazzled most of the time and just basically working with Mary. And then we tried out a, a version in Chicago. And we were in Chicago in rehearsal. And I mean, you don't want this whole graphic story, do you? Please do. Go for it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening I mean, and enjoying. They're, they're so much more interesting than working. Well, Things went a little bit sour in Chicago. I think what happened was what happens to a lot of people when they're afraid. I think Stephen got a little bit unsure and, and there started to be lots of tensions with the cast and with the writers and with everybody. And for some reason, he wasn't getting along with Mary. It was really tense between the two of them. And... We went into rehearsal one day and 
I forget who the actor was, was singing the housewife song. And she went over to the piano and she said to the musical director, you're playing it wrong. The ch- you know, you're playing the wrong chords and the wrong melody. And the musical director said, no, I'm not. This is the chart, see? And she said, but this is not my chart. And he said, um, but this is what I, well, he said, Stephen did a little fiddling around with it last night. And Mary got very upset. And she dragged me by the arm. She said, come with me. We went back to the hotel and she started to cry, which she never did. Mary was the wittiest, warmest, most wonderful person to be in a room with and always, you know, brave and and stalwart. And suddenly she just broke down and she said, I want you to go to... Western Union, and I want you to send him a telegram and pull our song. At which point I started to cry, and I said, pull our song, Mary. And she said, nope, pull the song. It's not going in like that. Of course she was right. She was dead right. And so we pulled the song, and he gave the housewife song our wonderful housewife song was dead. And he gave the housewife song to Craig Cornelia, who wrote a really good housewife song. And so we were left at that point with school teacher song, which went into the show. And when the show opened in Chicago, it got, it was singled out and got a dazzling review. So he couldn't possibly get rid of that. And so it made it into the show in New York as well. Those two really never had much to do with each other at that point. They were no longer speaking. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else to tell. Nothing except that the show was pretty much a mess. And Studs Terkel took me out for a drink during previews. And he also was a very little guy, like Julie. And he said... Darling, it feels like we're on the deck of the Titanic and there's a crazy midget at the helm. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if Steve ever heard that story, God, I hope not. But it did sink. However, so many people loved the show and loved the song. It's just the most wonderful songs by James Taylor, by Mickey Grant, by Stephen Schwartz, and by us. And it has had a thriving life in stock and amateur. It's done everywhere. It's had lots of revivals, not on Broadway yet, but everywhere else. And it's done everywhere. So I guess, you know, it was a flop and yet not. But it was my first show. Hmm. And tell us a little bit about this. When you're... You could be anywhere. You're in a building and you see a plumber. When you're at a restaurant and you see a waiter uh, or the hostess, whoever, yeah. does it make you look at, at at those things differently, those people differently? Has it changed your perspective is what I mean? Not everything in the show, but what really rocked me to my foundation and changed my perspective was a song that Mickey Grant wrote called If I Could Have Been. It goes, if I could have been what I could have been, I could have been something. It is so moving. It is so incredibly moving. And a song she wrote called, it was a song for the cleaning, yeah, I think it was called Cleaning Women. But especially if I could have been, and I thought about my father who was a man who, He was the oldest of four brothers. He was from a a really literate family, but his father lost everything in the Depression. And my father helped put his brothers through school, the Arkin brothers. And he was an enormously talented painter, writer. There was so much he could have done. And so every time I heard the song, I would just dissolve in tears. 
it's really a powerful song. And Cleaning Women, my God, it just is a wonderful song. Some of the other, it's hard for me to remember a lot of them now. There was a wonderful monologue in the show about a fireman, which also made me look at firemen and policemen differently. Because during the course of the monologue, he says, the thing is, I do something real. I saved somebody's life today. I do something real, which is really profound. So in that sense, I think it it did. And and the show has been updated. There are two songs in it now by Lin-Manuel, Lin-Manuel Miranda, one about someone who takes care of other people's Children, I believe, or old people. I can't. No, I think it's somebody who takes care of an old person. I can't remember. There have been so many recent revivals, but yeah, it's a good show. It really had so much potential, and it has had a long life. So I guess you know Stephen can't complain. What have you learned about the power, just on a personal level, of writing? Oh my. The power of writing itself or the power of the theater? Just writing itself. Just sitting down with pen and paper or a typewriter or nowadays a a laptop and write. Well, for me personally, it's there are times when when I, I write something. There are a lot of times when it's just struggle, struggle, struggle. But the fact of the matter is, if you have all of the information, if you know who the character is, what the moment is, and what the song has to accomplish, the song almost writes itself. But the miracle of songwriting sometimes is that in searching around for the right word to rhyme or for the right thing to say for this particular moment. What would I say if I crawled into the character's head and I, you know, what would be the net, next logical sound out of my mouth? Sometimes something comes out, just comes into my fingers and I put it down and I look at the screen and I think, God, where did that come from? And there are wonderful moments like that where you just, you know, you just know inside that this is, this is really good. And then there are other moments when I write and write and write and write, and then I look at it the next morning, and I hate everything I've written, and I go back and do it all over again, but starting from a different place. I guess a lot of, a lot of what we write comes from the subconscious, even though we struggle to shape it well and to rhyme it well and to, you know, use whatever skills we have as dramatists, something else happens and I can't really explain what it is. And I guess it's just years of having done it or all those influences, all those people who influenced me, whose work I so admire and 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 what they taught me, and it just all comes together. I'm not making sense, am I? It's hard to articulate. (laughs) It's very good what you're saying. It's really hard to articulate. It's not that difficult to teach the basic skills of lyric writing because there are rules that don't change even when other theatrical rules are broken you know everybody thinks that that Hamilton is groundbreaking and wildly new and different the fact of the matter is that although there are a lot of things about Hamilton that are groundbreaking and new Hamilton follows in the strictest sense the classical architecture of a musical it's really a classical musical I know this comes as a shock, but it's true. It has all the earmarks of it, which is one of the things that makes it work so well because it also has wonderfully innovative things about it, the way in which it's cast, the use of of rap music for, 
you know, this particular story, the way he's blended some quotes from classical musicals into this contemporary language, things like that. But it is a classical musical structure. How important do you think theater is and why? Oh, I think theater is vital. I have seen theater change people's lives, literally. The making of theater can change people's lives. I'll tell you a really fast story. For two years before I, I really started, you know, got into the theater, started to have children and then got into the writing of theater, I was a teacher and I was thrown into a class of special needs children with no training in special needs education. I was put in there as a sort of substitute teacher. And I had a lot of difficulty trying to reach them. I didn't know what to do. I had 28 kids. And amongst, I mean, some of them severely compromised kids. And I took them down to the auditorium and I started doing music with them. And then I decided to write they were so good at singing and learning songs and it seemed to elevate them. It seemed to, it seemed to just, you know, change them in so many ways and bring them out and make them more social and, and more alert. And so I wrote a very simple version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs it was the first thing I ever wrote theatrically book, music and lyrics. <laughs> Don't ask. And I did it with them. And they were extraordinary. I cannot begin to tell you how it changed them. And they became, the, you know, they were the pariahs of the school and they became the stars of the school. And then the whole district came to see it. And it changed their lives irrevocably in a lot of ways. And I've seen it happen to people, even people who went and joined community theaters and and started acting or you know, working in some way on theater projects for some reason, which I've, my, you know, little lame theory of it is, and I'm not, I'm sure I'm not right. I'm not a psychiatrist, but for me, at least when I was acting, it was the ability to climb into somebody else's persona, climb into somebody else's head to hide inside of another character's skin and once inside somebody else's body or mind to be able to act in ways that I was never able to act as Susan. That, you know, I was able to be somebody else, which empowered me in a way so that I was able to do things I would never dream of doing as myself. And I think that's why people who stutter can get up on a stage and act and there's no sign of the stuttering. People who are pathologically shy as I was can get up on a stage and suddenly are not shy. And it, it followed me into, into, into life because I, you know, I can walk into a room where I don't know anybody. And although I'm dying inside because I think, oh my God, I, what am I going to say to anybody? What am I going to do? I suddenly crawl into this character who can do it, and I'm able to walk into the room and be perfectly poised and and friendly. And so I think that that's part of the power of it. As far as sitting in the theater and watching it, I think that when something is really wonderful as was this show I saw last night, which just was transcendent. The band's visit, it can really rock you to your foundation. I mean, it can really change your perception of the world and people and relationships, and and it can just bathe you in beauty, which has to be transformative. Very well spoken. Wow. Really? I sounded like gobbledygook to me, but I no. I just get I get carried away with the emotion of it. Uh, I 
Yeah. You took me everywhere with that answer. I was misty-eyed, and then I was in a state of wonder, and then I was thinking, oh. and I was remembering all, <laughs> all in one answer. Wow. Well, if you just think of the shows that have really, you know, they don't come along that often, you know. But there are some that just, you know, you walk out of the theater changed. Yeah. And you just, I wrote, I have two friends who were in the cast of this show. And I wrote to them late last night when I got home. And I said, you know, it's very rare that the earth moves in the theater. I said, but last night it it stood up and turned over on its head and, you know, it was just, it's just a wonderful show. So, a rarity. <laughs> I know that you probably have a certain line from one of your lyrics, and I don't want you to tell us what it is yet, that you're especially proud of. You think, this is, wow, that was a great line. Can you think of, of one? Oh, my God, how can I think of it? My God, my God. Ah. Uh, <sighs> From which show? Okay. You got it? Well, it's it's not a line. It's like a little... Can I isolate the line? Give me a second. Let me... Well, can I quote the whole four lines? You can. It? That's what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay. There's a character... I did a musical, a small musical on Broadway called The Triumph of Love. Like working, it was one of those shows that it closed too soon because although all the other critics loved it, the New York Times did not. Ben Brantley did not. But it developed a cult following, and so it's it's well known by people who love musical theater. And there's a character in this. It's based on an old Marivaux play, the French playwright Marivaux. And there's a character in it named Hesione, who is an older woman who lives with her brother, who is a philosopher, a famous philosopher. This is back in the 18th century. And they live in a walled garden away from the world and, you know, just devote themselves to this, to learning and reading and all of that and lead very sterile lives. And... The garden is invaded by this young princess who has fallen in love with the prince who lives there, their nephew who lives there. I'm not going to tell you the whole plot, but this young woman who invades the garden disguises herself as a young man. And in order to get what she wants, she makes everybody, she makes both the philosopher and his sister fall in love with her to get what she was. It's a complicated plot. But she is entreating this older woman and saying, why won't you come to town with me? Why won't you? Whatever. And the woman sings a sort of autobiographical song called Serenity. And here come the lines. And she says, the summer that I was 17, my heart was an open door. It welcomed all comers sight unseen and trusted the smiles they wore. They tore at my heart like hungry birds. Oh, wait a minute. They... Wait, uh, my heart was an open door. It wasn't no common sight unseen. It was. God almighty, I can't remember. I can't remember. My head is so full of the show. I'm, I'm writing at the moment. And the work I was doing before, and now I've, it's completely gone out of my head. Oh, they, 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 da, 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 da. can you wait half a second and I can look it up really yeah, fast? Absolutely. <laughs> this is going to kill me if I don't find this. Wait a minute. Thank God I'm sitting at my computer. Okay. Oh, here it comes. I'm just going to listen quietly. It's Betty Buckley. Can I play it for you? Yeah, let's let's do it. Um, I'm 
the summer that I was 17, my heart Okay, there it is. They came in a whirl of wanton words, those feckless and false young men. They tore at my heart like hungry birds and never came back again. Those are the lines. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So, vastly different from other shows I've written, like Jelly's Last Jam, which was all about the black experience and the invention of jazz or Minsky's, which is all about burlesque or the secret life of bees, which I'm doing at the moment, which is, you know, South Carolina in the 1960s or any number of, you know, but those lines in particular, for some reason, move me. Well, tell us a little bit about this project, The Secret Life of Bees. Oh, it's so exciting. It's a wonderful novel by a woman named Sue Monk Kidd. It was on the bestseller list for the better part of a year. And then it was made into a movie. The movie is good, but the novel is spectacular. And my agent who is with William Morris represents, or William Morris represents Sue Monk Kidd, the woman who wrote the novel. And my agent was reading the novel and called me and said, I think this would make a great musical. Would you be interested? And I read the novel and I think I got halfway through it and I said, yes, 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 yes. And he said, who would you like to write the book? And I said, well, Lynn Nottage is a friend of mine, but she's not a William Morris client. And he said, are you kidding? Lynn Nottage would be great. Because Lynn has, well, now she has two Pulitzer Prizes, but she had one at the time. She's a wonderful writer. And to make a long story short, it was the whole package was put together, and Duncan Sheik was chosen to write the music, and Sam Gold was chosen to direct it. It was one of those blessed collaborations where we all got into the room and everybody wanted exactly the same take on the material. Everybody knew what this musical should be and had to be. And I think this is what Sam was looking for. And as soon as he saw that we were all on the same page, he was thrilled and he came on board and we wrote it and we did it. At New York's New York Stage and Film has a, a summer program up at Vassar College. They use one of the theaters there, and they do s staged readings or readings where people just sit in chairs and read and sing through material just so that you can have a look at it. But they throw you up in front of an audience immediately, <laughs> which is terrifying, but a great way to do it. Janine Tesori calls it kamikaze writing. Well, you just, you, you're forced to confront the effect the material is having on an audience and to keep working on it as people keep coming to see it. And so we had a glorious time up there, two weeks. And then we came back here and worked on it a lot more because we had learned a lot up there and we just had a three-week lab where we we had the actors for the first week and they learned everything and we continued to work on it then we had five days without the actors where we just worked 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 worked, worked you know did rewrites again and then the actors came back and we worked some more and we did a presentation and it was it doesn't often happen this way where everybody in the room is just thrilled to death, including the investors. And so we're going to try it out. We're going to open at the Atlantic Theater where the band's visit tried out and Spring Awakening tried out and move from there to Broadway. So it's very exciting. 
you know, we were talking on the phone the other day, and you were saying, yeah. I've had a couple of pop recordings, but most of the recordings have been, or, or performances have been for the stage. I'm curious, can you tell us about a, just a couple of the pop recordings that you've had? Yes, well, shortly after I began to write with Julie, Julie Stein, he called me up one day and he said, Frank is going into the studio. I said, Frank who? <laughs> he said, what are you, stupid? I said, Frank who? He said, Sinatra, Sinatra. And he said, he's doing an album of saloon songs. I didn't know what a saloon song was. And he said, it's... You know, songs about this guy who loses his broad and then he sings this. So somehow or other, I deciphered what he was saying. And he said, I've written a tune. He wants, wants us to do a song. So I've written this tune and I'm sending it over by messenger. It was on a cassette. <laughs> Remember cassettes? And he said, so he's going into the studio on Tuesday. This was Friday. And he said, so write a lyric fast. So I got the cassette and I listened to it. It was a great tune. And I thought, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I had never written a song out of thin air. I needed a character. I needed, I didn't know what to do. And my then husband, my second husband, <laughs> who was just an extraordinarily wonderful man and not in the theater. Well, he was in the theater. He was a theater lawyer, but he wasn't creative and he said well look why don't you just pretend that you're writing for a character and that character is Frank Sinatra you know what he's like and he's lost this woman that he's in love with and he sings this song and bingo I went in I think and it took me an hour and a half to write the lyric and I brought it to Julie and he said well he said this is you know this is wrong, you've got to change this, and you've got to change this, which is always what happens with everything. And he said, otherwise it's great. He said, but this word, you've got to get rid of this word. You got Nobody's, got, he's never going to sing this word. And the word was apropos. <laughs> and I said, I know, but it just feels so right at this moment in the song. So we argued back and forth, and he said, I'm telling you, He's going to come back and he's going to say, get rid of that word. <laughs> well, he sent the song to Sinatra and Sinatra came back and he said, I love this song. He said, and you know what I love best about it? He said, whoever put the word apropos into a pop song? <laughs> so, <laughs> he said he did not allow us into the studio because he knew Julie and Julie, Julie, was known to be a big pain in the butt, you know, sometimes in the studio. But he went into the studio, he cut the intro, which Julie had written, which was really, we had both written. And it was sort of a great intro, but he cut it. And he cut the bridge, which probably would have sent Julie over the edge. But when we got the recording back, it was so beautiful without the bridge. And it was, a, I think, a Gordon Jenkins arrangement. And I, there was a man affiliated with the publishing company who brought us the record. I was in Julie's office. Now, remember, I had never done anything except working, you know, but I was really like Miss Nobody from nowhere. And they sat me down and they put this record on. And I almost fainted, and I said, oh, my God, that's Frank Sinatra, and he's singing my words. And the song was really gorgeous. And then he asked us for another song, not on that album, but a little bit later. And we wrote another song for him called It's Sunday, about just sung about what it's like on a Sunday morning to be with somebody you love. And he, again, he just loved, loved, loved the song. And so the songs have a life. Jonathan Schwartz plays them all the time. You know, he plays a lot of Sinatra. And any of these radio stations that play Sinatra recordings play them a lot. 
But that's about it. That's my pop career, except what I'm really hoping is that I'm now, I've written, I'm in the middle of writing another show called Betty Boop with David Foster. Do you know David Foster? Not personally, <laughs> but I know uh, who he is. <laughs> yeah. And I keep saying, and, you know, he keeps saying, ah, oh, this is a great song. This is good. And I keep hoping that some of those songs will make it out into the world you know, aside from just being inside of Betty Boop and that finally I'll have some pop songs out there. But that's the extent of my pop career, which is not very impressive. Not very impressive? Having Frank Sinatra record your song for your very first pop recording? <laughs> A lot of people <laughs> would, would could only dream of that. <laughs> Well, it was kind of like the end of his career too. You know, it was I think that was his his last album or his next to last album or it was a thrill. It was and it is and sometimes I get these old guys who knew him or who you know know his music a lot. Some guy who wrote a book like the 100 best recordings of Frank Sinatra and both of the songs made it into there and I I'm still sort of in shock, you know, I don't think anybody buys the book or reads it, but it's, you know, the fact that I was able to do it because it seemed like such a mountain to climb. I mean, think about it. With You have no information and you just suddenly have to come up with a whole scenario in your head. Just seemed very difficult to me. So I have great respect for pop songwriters, especially the really great ones. It's a great song. Great. What? Oh, the song from the the song from She Shot Me Down, Hey Look No Crying. Oh, you know the song? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Full disclosure yeah. here. Uh. I've never heard anybody else say this. I'm 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 sure there's other people, but that album, She Shot Me Down, is my favorite of his. Oh, it's mine too. <laughs> I love it. Great. Well he did one of Steve Sondheim's songs on it that gorgeous. We've got a good thing going. Yeah, the first yeah. track. Yep. Yeah, just beautiful, and it's a wonderful. It's just a wonderful album. Yeah. So, but you know, nobody plays Sinatra anymore except these few radio stations, which is sad because nobody could sing a lyric like he could. Very true. You know, he was just, and he cared about lyrics. Really cared about them. So, you know, I guess that's that it's really a great loss. What would you yeah. say is the biggest struggle or obstacle that you've overcome? With songwriting? With anything that you c would care to share. Um, oh, well, God, there have been several of them. My first marriage was very difficult and it was difficult getting out of it because it just was and so that was an enormous mountain to climb and I think that my life really began in earnest when I met my second husband it was almost like a rebirth and it was the first time in my life that I I ever felt completely safe in the world I didn't as a child because as loving and wonderful as my parents were I never felt that they were protection against the world they they seemed to be babes in the woods themselves so I never really felt terribly safe and then my first husband was difficult and violent and so the first time I really felt safe in the world was when Jerry came along and um, and he was my rock. I mean, he was just incredible. And he was that for my children as well. So that was difficult. And I think I'd had a recent, creatively, I had a struggle with one show simply because 
I was dealing with a lot of people who had never done this before, and it was about another culture, about another country. Um, it was it was an Indian story, and the director who had never directed for the stage is a wonderful movie director, brilliant, brilliant movie director, but had never directed for the stage. So my only anchor in that whole situation was the composer who is, who had never done this before either, may I say, but is a, a director himself besides being a composer and in some way sort of got it and was able to be a, a kind of support for me. But it was a terrible struggle, the whole thing. And I, you know, I don't think it's really going to go anywhere, which is probably just as well because I have these other two shows that I'm in the thick of. And I have to say that three shows at once was sort of overwhelming. But it's difficult to do a musical. It's the, probably the most difficult thing in the world to do, which is why so many of them fail. And if you don't have the tools necessary to do it, if you don't have other people who know how to do it and you don't have a clear direction as to where you're going and why, it's impossible. It's like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the mountain. It, it, it just can't be done. So I guess those are my two biggest struggles. What advice would you give to somebody who is going through a rough patch, whether it's creatively or personally? What would you, what would you say to somebody? Well, two things I would say. First of all, you have to think about coming out the other side of it. I I guess I guess the struggle I didn't mention was the death of my husband which happened 4 years ago. He got terribly ill and before we could turn around it just took him. And thank God these three shows had come along at the same time. I did what I do whenever I'm frightened, which is whenever I'm in the dentist chair. <laughs> a fear I never got over, or frightened, or horribly sad, or angry, or feeling helpless, I run away into my work. And I find that it's, it's a safe haven for me. It's a distraction, but it's also, it forces me to focus on something with almost a laser-like focus. And that, you know, it's similar to, to the technique that's used in childbirth <laughs> when the pain of childbirth is intense. And so this Dr. Lamaze, who, who came up with the Lamaze method, discovered that if women concentrated on their breathing and on what was happening and had to concentrate fiercely, that that would push the pain away to a large extent. And this is the same principle. If I have to focus, if I'm sitting in the dentist chair and I'm really turning to jelly because I'm so terrified, I take the most difficult, thorniest problem I've had in writing that day or that week, and I work it out in my head. I force myself to work it out. And then I'm not afraid anymore. And that coupled with the fact that you have to say to yourself, I will come out the other end of this. I can't wait till I come out the other end of this, but I will. And I have to keep going and I have to be really strong so that I can come out the other end of this. I think, I mean, I don't want to sound, you know, pedantic or anything, but that's about... That's the technique I use. Well, Will, thank you very, very much for sharing with us. It's been a great pleasure. You're very welcome. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. 
And don't give up if you're out there <laughs> writing songs because, you know, you will be heard eventually. Hmm. And if you if you really have the stuff, somebody will hear it, and it will happen. Well, not just songwriters, just anyone who's out there. Yes. What would you say in closing, open-ended to our listeners? Well, you know, I do master classes from time to time, and I guess the most difficult thing in the world for a young writer or a young actor or a young any anybody is getting started getting somebody to open the door even a crack and it's very frustrating because there are more no's out there than there are yeses and the first thing I always say to them is talent is important yes but the single most important quality a songwriter or an actor or a dancer or anybody can have is resilience the ability to you know when something terrible happens the ability to cry for a day and a half and then say, next. <laughs> and that's it. That's my philosophy of life. You know, I mean, truly, I mean, that's what's gotten me by. So, and it works. It really works. If you want to be anywhere near show business or any difficult profession or any difficult thing in life, I suppose. It's so interesting what you just said, to spend the whole day crying and then say, next, sort of like, yeah. hey, look, no crying. <laughs> well, <laughs> you see, that never occurred to me. <laughs> That's right. It comes from somewhere. You know not where, but it comes from somewhere. Anyway, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Bye-bye.